Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jim Jenkins, and good morning, and welcome to the 14th Annual Canadian Fertilizer Products Forum. My name is Jim Jenkins, as I said, from uh, Nutrien Fertilizer, and I'm the chair of the Fertilizer Canada's Products Committee, and I'll be your moderator today, and it's my privilege to do so. I'm really excited about this event because apparently we have 220 registered guests, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of this presentation because we have a, a very high level of excellence in the presenters that we're going to be uh, talking to today. So. Fertilizer Canada, in joint partnership with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the Fertilizers and Supplement Advisory Committee hosts this event each year to help ensure that fertilizers and supplements in Canada are globally competitive and that growers have access to new products in a timely manner. Our second CFPF session is focused on products and emerging trends. This session will consist of presentations from Dr. Claudia Wagner Riddle, Agrometology in the School of Environmental Sciences, University of Well, she'll be speaking about unintended impacts of nitrogen fertilizer addition. Can we do better? Doctor, second up will be Dr. Terry Roberts, formerly president of IPNI. He'll be speaking about biostimulants, biofertilizers, nanofertilizers. Is this really the future of the fertilizer industry. And third up, we have our guest, Greg Bartley from Pulse Canada, who will be speaking on phosphonic acid detected. Are fertilizers contributing to MRL non-compliances? Throughout the session, uh, you will have our, you should see our Q&A box. There'll also be a chat box, but I asked you to put your questions into the Q&A box and at that then they'll be available for participants uh, for questions. After the presentations, I'll read off the questions to our speakers to answer. We are targeting for a 20 minute presentation from the speakers and then 10 minutes for questions. If we have additional time at the end, we'll bring everyone back and then have a big question uh, panel set for you as well. Reminder that the session today will be recorded and sent to all of you who have joined today. And if we don't get to any questions, they will be recorded and answers will be provided after the, after the timing of the forum. I want to thank you all for joining us today and a special thank you to our presenters of products and emerging trends. To begin our session, I'd like to introduce Dr. Claudia Wagner Riddle. Dr. Riddle is a professor of agrometrology in the School of Environmental Sciences, University of Guelph, Canada. Originally from Brazil, Buenos Dia Senora, Claudia has degrees from the University of Sao Paulo and Guelph. She leads an internationally renowned research program using greenhouse gas emissions measurement to determine the carbon footprint of food, feed, and fuel produced by agriculture. Claudia is the executive of the Soils at Guelph and leads an INSERC CREATE training program on climate smart soils. She is also a fellow of the Science, Soil Science Society of America and the American Metrology Society and Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal Agricultural and Forest Metrology. Claudia has recently appointed, was recently appointed director of the North American Regional Chapter of the International Nitrogen Initiative and has published over 140 papers and has an H index of 39 on Google Scholar. Please welcome Dr. Virtually, that is. Please welcome Dr. Claudia Wagner Riddle. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. And away you go. Thank you very much for that introduction, Jim. And good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm going to get right into it. So, um, as uh, mentioned, the title of my presentation is shown here the unintended impacts of nitrogen fertilizer. Can we do better? Um, I was asked to sort of set the stage here and uh, I will be asking a lot of questions, talking a lot about the drivers uh, for the kind of global drivers for us to do better. 
But I actually, thinking a little bit about my title, I thought really what I should be um, prompting us all to think about is the fact that we must do better. And I'm using we here in the global sense of there are a lot of, uh, there's industry, but there are also practitioner and farmers and academics, and we need the best minds to set uh, and work together to address the nitrogen problem. So I'm going to start with a few things that are probably um, uh, well known to most of the audience. But the fact that we have um, made an unprecedented change in our global nitrogen uh, budget. We're adding more in uh, anthropogenic sources, such as fertilizer production and biological nitrogen fixation compared to natural sources. This has been called an unprecedented sort of geoengineering um, experiment that's going on and that we've changed the nitrogen cycle in ways that are much more substantial than, for example, the carbon or phosphorus uh, cycle. Of course, we also all know that the positive part of this is that um, up to 40% of uh, people nowadays are alive because and, and are being fed because of this nitrogen fixation. Uh, but we also do know that the distribution is very uneven around the world, creating hotspots of uh, nitrogen loss. Um, and um, we also know well that uh, nitrogen fixation, the intended addition here shown in blue arrows in either fertilizer or biological nitrogen fixation is it's intended to go to crops that then are fed to animals, manure cycles back. But this cycle of blue arrows, instead of being a tight cycle, it's a very leaky cycle where we have unintended flows that result in accumulation of reactive nitrogen, either in the form of nitrous oxide, nitrogen oxides, ammonia, nitrate leaching, or um, particulate matter in the atmosphere. This is a cascading effect because an ammonia or an, a nitrogen atom lost in the form of ammonia can be deposited and then further contribute. So it's contributing to um, particulate matter, but then it's also contributing to other issues such as N2O. The blue boxes kind of um, fit, uh, uh, highlight what the environmental issues uh, are uh, re directly related. So greenhouse gas balance, stratospheric ozone loss, urban air quality, um, so on, acid soil acidification, and then eutrophication of either terrestrial or aquatic systems. Um, this makes for a very complex and um, sort of difficult to translate message to the public as well as um, policy. But there has been um, an organization around these issues to try to a bit simplify. So put it through, um, group all these impacts into five societal threats as the European nitrogen assessment has done in terms of climate change or greenhouse gas balance air, water, and soil quality, as well as biodiversity. Um, <clears throat> the push for um, finding solutions and implementing solutions at the global level has been going on for a number of years, but we can say that there has been a uh, sort of gaining of steam in the last few years um, at the, the UN level in the sense of um, creating a sustainable nitrogen uh, management resolution, uh, a declaration last year with the purpose of having nitrogen waste by 2030, and recently uh, a task group that is going to be looking into creating an interconvention nitrogen coordination mechanism. And that stems from the fact that 
Nitrogen touches a lot of international conventions, be it air quality, uh, climate change, stratosphere, uh, biodiversity and marine uh, conventions, and that there is a perceived and very real need to coordinate the work of these conventions around the issue or the challenge of nitrogen. Um, there's also recognition that nitrogen use impacts several of the sustainable development goals in both good and, and bad ways. So, um, you know, addressing hunger and um, well-being, as well as clean water and um, climate action and so on. And the, the middle one here is one that I think is more, most relevant for this forum where there is a real need for innovation and creation of uh, infrastructures or coordination of, of groups to address uh, the nitrogen problem. So an example of this is um, a, a recent in initiative of um, US, e USDA and EPA in partnership with um, TFI, IFDC, the Nature Conservancy and the corn growers. So this is, I think, a good example how the realization that it's, it's not just an industry issue, but it's an industry that, uh, it's an issue that is, uh, involves multifacets and that requires coordination and, and, and multi-partnerships. Um, the 4R um, nutrient stewardship uh, program is, is one of the um, sort of flagships uh, trying to address nitrogen losses as well as uh, increasing uh, profitability by farmers. And um, for the next few slides, I'll be talking a little bit about the work that uh, we have done in relation to nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, so nitrous oxide emissions is one of those reactive um, losses from uh, the agricultural system. And uh, recently there's been a lot of, even CBC and the Saskatchewan uh, Star Phoenix had uh, headlines around nitrous oxide with, and that was related to this recent global N2O budget uh, that has, um, again, emphasized that agriculture is the main uh, source of nitrous oxide. But one of the, the major sort of startling things out of this paper is that we are really in a ramping up um, uh, trajectory in terms of, uh, so these, the black and yellow lines are what's currently happening. And the other lines are the projections uh, based on uh, different scenarios in terms of growth. And we are really on the fast uh, lane here in terms of N2O um, emissions. So the idea that we urgently need solutions, and so far we haven't figured out how to feed so many people without adding uh, nitrogen fertilizer, then it falls back to how can we be better manage that nitrogen fertilizer to uh, reduce emissions. And there has been a lot of work going on um, so uh, to address that um, at the field level. So we know that uh, for the carbon footprint of corn grain, which is a, a very widely grown crop in North America, we know that synthetic fertilizer is about half of the whole uh, carbon footprint. And uh, if you consider manure, it gets almost close to uh, three quarters. So to address uh, the losses, we do need to understand microbial systems because those are the ones that result in N2O uh, emissions through the process of nitrification and denitrification and work with all these uh, different sources. So, so some of the work we've done is it's been specific to synthetic fertilizer, where um, we know that when we add fertilizer at planting and then get rain, we get uh, N2O emissions here expressed as uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So what are some of the things that we can do through the four R's to address that? Uh, so using enhanced efficiency fertilizers that have both urease and nitrification inhibitors, 
could delay the nitrogen release and reduce N2O emissions. So we did a three-year study um, to, to look at those effects. And as others have found, um, this is not always um, the case. So in, in one out of the three years, we did not see effects. What is shown here is cumulative N2O emissions um, and comparing urea uh, with or without a nitrification and um, urease inhibitor and both and UAN applied at the sixth um, leave stage uh, injected into the soil. So in two out of the years for UAN, we found an effect and one that we didn't. And for two out of the three years, we found an effect for urea. Now, this was all set up um, with corn um, in a system where inorganic fertilizer was the only um, nitrogen input. So it wasn't manured uh, or with cover crops. And a recent trend is uh, that we do have a lot of interest in soil health. So in my own province of Ontario, um, uh, we've um, a, a group of both academics, but also um, industry uh, together with the Ontario government have developed uh, a health strategy for the province. Uh, 2015, was the year, um, International Year of the Soil, that again had healthy, healthy soils as um, one of, uh, in their um, saying for the, for the launch of this uh, International Year. And um, a couple of years ago, the Soil Conservation Council of Canada launched this um, Soil Year Undies um, campaign in the name of soil conservation. So it's all about trying to understand the soil microbiology and um, you know, get farmers' attention to, you know, if you, if you bury your underwear in soil that has been managed in different ways. And the idea is that a better management, a diverse rotation, for example, um, will have a more active microbial community that will consume uh, the cotton in that underwear and, and um, uh, indicate that uh, everything is working well. Um, this has been um, at a, a, a broader level um, also been uh, of interest for large companies like Cargill, who just recently uh, uh, announced that they will um, advance regenerative agriculture. So this term is really kind of getting some traction and the idea that we need to move beyond sustainability in the sense that if what we're sustaining is a system that is broken, uh, that's really not good. We need to regenerate the power of soils. And even there's some interest in um, uh, from fi financial systems, from investors to investing in, um, in practices that are not just sustainable, but regenerative. Um, and this other initiative here, um, Ecosystem Service Market Consortium, is again um, helping farmers to improve soil health system that benefits society. Uh, so if we look at what is recommended in within regenerative ag agriculture, it's, it's about keeping soils healthy. And I know that there is, um, uh, we could discuss at length what exactly does that mean. But in, in general, for the far, for farmers, what that means are recommendations to increase crop diversity, um, so not just in rotation, but also using cover crops, keeping the soil covered, minimizing soil disturbance, so use of no-till, basically keeping living roots in the soil year round and uh, adding organic amendments. So it's all about feeding the soil um, through addition of carbon. So the challenge is then what are the right sources and products to manage all these nutrients holistically? And I will finish with um, 
uh, uh, recent example. So this is data hot off the press that we've uh, obtained or that we've measured uh, in an experiment that started in the fall last year. And um, so it's a one year of data. Uh, the three lines, um, the different colors ignore that. Um, it's basically different um, reps in a way, we could say so. And the, these, this is after oats, after red clover, and then the control uh, th that was just wheat stubble. And um, we applied 30 kilograms of N as a starter for corn, and then 120 um, as UAN as side dress. And we can clearly see that adding cover crops, particularly leg legumes, obviously, um, actually makes things worse in terms of nitrous oxide emissions. So we are working on, or very interested in how could we manage um, this nitrogen a bit better. And so in this forum for emerging products, what I would like to challenge uh, our audience and all of those uh, working on developing these products is to keep in mind that we need to approach this holistically with products that work with the improvement of soil health. So um, right now, if we look at our toolbox, yes, we have nitrification inhibitors. They work most of the time. Uh, we have urease inhibitors, but can we do better? Uh, because really, we, we must do better. So uh, here are my main take-home take points. Um, we have all these in unintended losses that have affected our water, air, and soil at an unprecedented scale. So we must do better. This is not going to go away. There are several global initiatives that um, are getting put in place that will help push for solutions. Uh, but looking at in addition of synthetic fertilizer within um, a soil health and regenerative agriculture framework is uh, what we need to do to address climate change. So I'll leave you with this question. Can we develop products that address the nitrogen challenge? And I'll finish, finish with a um, beautiful picture of our um, site uh, with corn. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Dr. Wagner Riddle. Uh, both a complex and a critical problem to solve, no doubt. Uh, that, was, that was excellent. And folks, uh, we are exactly on time, which means there's a, a goodly amount of uh, minutes left for the questions. So I'm gonna go to the Q&A box. Reminder, put your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box and I will start reading the questions out and we'll run them for 10 minutes and then uh, move on to the next session. So first question, uh, Tom Bruslana. Hello, Tom. In years, when N2O emission is small, is it important to see efficacy in reduction? Yeah, great question, Tom. So uh, I, I think uh, the short answer would be, uh, no, and, and that was so in one of the one of the years that we saw a, a reduction for urea was a very dry year. And, um, you know, you get instead of 0.3 kilo, uh, kilograms of N2O uh, per hectare per year, you get 0.1 or 0.15. So that doesn't really address the big problem. So I think we really need to target those hot moments, so those times when uh, we know losses will be, will be very large. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is from Lise Leblanc. Do you have comparisons at the same time with traditional nitrogen fertilizers with no EFF? Uh, for example, uh, ammonium sulfate, urea, ammonium nitrate, and UAN, it would have been interesting to see the year that EFF did not decrease into O emission. 
The story could have been that it is still greatly decreased the emissions over typical fertilizers. Farmers will change their methods quicker if you show either or data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, for our setup, we were not looking at, we were just doing with and without the fertilizer, the inhibitor, the same type of, uh, so urea with and urea without. And we did not look at different formulations as well as we did UAN with and without. But we did, uh, th that was all in the same field. So I didn't show it because I was trying to keep it simple. We did compare UAN and urea uh, applied at different times. So there was a confounding factor of timing with the idea that, you know, if you apply later, does that decrease emissions? And we did not see um, an impact. It was actually, um, uh, slightly worse with the UAN applied later. And, and that is, has been seen in other studies as well because it all depends on when the, the rainfall occurs. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Tom Brusola. The increased N2O emission following red clover termination shows any form of nitrogen can lead to emissions. Is there work going on to search for microbes that can consume N2O? Uh, good question. I don't uh, know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that there probably are uh, microbiologists looking at, um, at that. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a good point that any form of N, N can lead to emissions. Um, but, uh, so, you know, with those, with the results I, I showed, um, a logical or, um, um, narrow conclusion would be, well, don't use cover crops, but we know that cover crops are good for a whole range of other things. Uh, we think that the end rate could not be reduced because that would be one way of going and saying, well, reduce the end rate to account for that legume input. A little bit of that can be done, but in general, um, I think the studies have shown that th that cannot take care of, that the end rate cannot be reduced too much. So then it's a matter of the timing of the release of the nitrogen. So. Anyway, a convoluted answer, but um, hopefully that addressed your question, Tom. Well, and, and just a reminder that if, uh, if there are further follow-up questions, you can add them into the chat and, uh, and we will be recording them and uh, seeking out answers after the event. So there's, there's a chance for further follow-up, but excellent discussion so far. So um, next question I have is from Dinesh. And the question was, does healthy soil help to reduce N2O emission? Uh, <laughs> weird after the answer to that question. Um, so, so far we've only started some of this work, but um, if we think, you know, what's being recommended to increase the health of, so of a soil is uh, the addition, like more crop diversification or use of cover crops and the results that I just show you would be shown you would be saying, well, no, um, we, but that was a short, short term experiment. Uh, we also did some work on long term uh, crop rotation trials where we compared diverse and non diverse rotations. And those were like, it's a corn, soybean, winter wheat with red, red clover versus corn uh, soybean. Uh, and what we see there is that uh, the diverse rotation has higher emissions, but if it's scaled by the nitrogen addition, because with that extra wheat, with the wheat year, we put more nitrogen fertilizer on. If it's scaled by the nitrogen input, the emissions are about the same. So I guess that would tell me uh, that the improving the soil organic matter, which has been shown in those long-term plots, does not necessarily, it increases emissions 
but not, um, um, yeah, that overall the emissions are not increased. Thank you. Um, looks like we have time for a couple more questions and they keep coming in. So you're very popular today on this topic. Uh, the next one is from Clyde Graham from Fertilizer Canada. What is the relationship between reduction of N2O emissions and soil organic carbon levels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really good uh, question. So the, the acknowledgement, it has to be a knowledge that um, nitrogen addition uh, contributes to carbon sequestration uh, through the improved productivity that we get, more carbon is added, so that contributes to carbon um, levels in the soil. Um, I don't know if we know exactly how those two are um, related. So I think um, a reduction of N2O that is uh, achieved through reduction in, in nitrogen inputs would be inversely related to soil carbon levels. But if that reduction can be achieved through other better nitrogen management, then the, the, uh, the reduction could be related to better soil organic uh, carbon levels. So I know, I mean, in the national inventory, um, we consider N2O emissions uh, derived from fertilizer, but we don't consider the carbon increase due to fertilizer. And I think that's something that they are trying to address. Um, so that's uh, an important point. Thank you. Uh, we just had one more come in. I think, yes, we do have time for it. So this is from Gasham. Can coated nitrogen fertilizers like urea coated with sulfur or bentonite added urea reduce the emissions problem? Uh, so I have not worked with those products um, and I'm not uh, like from the top of my head, I can't directly answer that question. So. I think these products tend to work in some circumstances and not in others. So it ends up, the winners end up being those that are consistently, you know, so over several regions, over several climates, the, the, the winners. So um, nitrification inhibitors have been shown to be one of those where several meta-analyses have shown consistent reduction in the range to 20 to 30%. Um, some of these other products, uh, like coated uh, products, that has not been shown, but I, I wouldn't rule it out. I think we're really looking for some novel um, chemistry, but that works with the microbiology to um, really make a, a dent into the losses. Thank you. Well, I think we're going to end the session there. Um... A reminder that if you do have additional questions as, as time goes on through the event today, we, we likely will have a bit of time at the very end, but we will still follow up with those questions if it's after the event with uh, Dr. Wagner Riddle um, to get some answers for you. And then of course those will be published. So at this time, we're going to move on to, uh, so oh, first of all, what I should do is on behalf of all the participants, give you a virtual okay, round of thanks. applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was excellent. Okay, great, thank Very you. Very excellent, thank you. All right, so um, next order of business, we are going to move on to uh, Dr. Terry Roberts. Uh, Dr. Roberts was president of the IPNI until it ceased operations in 2019. He is a former president of the Potash and Phosphate Institute, PPI, and Foundation for Agronomic Research, FAR. Terry has 30 years experience as a soil scientist and agro agronomist working in the global fertilizer industry. He currently provides consulting services to the fertilizer industry. Originally from Alberta, Canada, Terry grew up in a family owned and operated retail fertilizer business. He received a BSA in crop science and a PhD in soil fertility and plant nutrition from the University of Saskatchewan. He has been a certified crop advisor since 1999, and he has been recognized as a fellow of the American Society for Agronomy in 2001 
fellow of the Soil Science Society of America in 2017 and received ASA's Agronomic Service Award in 2013. So virtually, please welcome Dr. Terry. Uh, I know your presentation is gonna be excellent today. Thank you. So thank you, Jim. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to address this group. I um, wanna thank Fertilizer Canada for the invitation to share some thoughts uh, with you. Um, really want to share some information and some of my thoughts about, I guess, where we are now and where we're trending heading to in the future. But before doing that, I thought it might be useful to review where we've been. And I want to look a little bit into the past. And I think everybody recognizes that since agriculture began, uh, people knew that manures and ashes and compost, those type of things were of a benefit uh, to agriculture. But it wasn't until the 16th century that uh, alchemists laid the groundwork for chemistry as a distinct science with application in agriculture, which, which led to fertilizers. And of course, last year, we separate, uh, celebrated the 350th anniversary of the discovery of phosphorus. And uh, Ike and I produced a special edition of Better Crops that talks about that. If you're interested, you can find that uh, online. And so really that was kind of the beginning of the fertilizer industry. In the mid 1800s, uh, Justice von Liebig spoke of mixing sulfuric acid with finely ground bones to make them more effective in supplying phosphorus. There was a recognition that bone meal uh, is, was a very useful product that people could use, but he talked about acidulating that phosphorus. And in the mid, uh, mid 1800s, there was several patents uh, taken out concerning that process of acidulating bones. At the same time period, John Bennett Laws and Joseph Henry Gilbert began experimenting in England, uh, which Excuse is me, Dr. Now Roberts. Yes. I hate to interrupt. Can you share your PowerPoint presentation, please? Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me about that. I thought it had... I this is a visualization exercise for us to imagine what you're talking exercise. about. <laughs> ah. Well, I hope that's a little better. Can you see my screen now, everybody? Yes. My moderator? Anyway, I, I was just talking about the history of uh, fertilizer and how that it really all began in the mid-1800s. Um, and experimental work on fertilizers began at the Rothamsted Experimental Station in 1843. And you can see a picture in the lower right hand corner of this screen uh, showing some of the world's oldest ongoing fertility trials. And uh, a lot of those initial trials were on phosphorus fertilizer. Um, superphosphate uh, as a product was uh, really began production in 1843 at the same time that these patents were taking out. And it was made from bones, but bones were a limited supply. Rock phosphate was discovered uh, in the United States in 1867, but it was uh, recognized in England about 20 years before that. And they started to make superphosphate from rock phosphate. It dominated uh, phosphorus fertilizers for about 100 years until uh, the introduction of phosphoric acid. And that was then used to treat rock phosphate to produce a triple superphosphate. And that product uh, was in existence and peaked until the mid-1980s, and it has since been replaced by ammonium phosphates, even though uh, there's quite a bit of interest in triple superphosphate today. Early in the 19th century, Peruvian guano became an important nitrogen fertilizer, but its deposits were somewhat limited. And sodium nitrate uh, was discovered in the Atacama Desert in Chile in the early 1800s. Sodium nitrate, they call it caliche, or it is simply saltpeter. And I've got here a photo of myself holding some of that mineral, which can be present on the surface or within you know, several meters of the surface. And uh, it's relatively easy to mine. And so it's still mined today, and it's an excellent fertilizer product. One of the third important fertilizer discovered in the 1800s was really ammonium sulfate. It was a byproduct of the coal 
industry. And I think everybody's familiar with uh, the Haber Bosch and that process that was discovered by uh, you know Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch at the beginning of the Second World War to convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. Um, the beginning of the First World War uh, also sort of began the beginning of potash. Uh, it was discovered in the United States in several states as brines in the uh, beginning of the 1915s. It was discovered in Canada, um, you know, a little later, and that was an important component. The Tennessee Valley Authority was created by the U.S. government in 1933 to control flooding in the Tennessee Valley uh, River Basin, and that uh, takes drainage water from uh, Kentucky all the way up to Virginia and North Carolina, as well as uh, Georgia and Tennessee. And so they were trying to control flooding, generate hydroelectricity, and also uh, it was intended to develop fertilizers. And you can see here on the screen uh, a variety of different fertilizer products that were either developed or improved or their processes improved by TVA. Actually, about 75% of the fertilizers used worldwide were developed or improved in the 1950s through 70s by TVA. The TVA went out of business uh, in the early 1990s because of a lack of public funding. And so there really hasn't been much happening in the fertilizer industry of any really new products uh, since then. So today we have a lot of specialty fertilizers, which includes the enhanced efficiency fertilizers, which Claudia mentioned. And then we also have, and we're seeing the beginning of nano fertilizers, bio fertilizers, and biostimulants. And I want to talk a little bit about those products. The development of specialty fertilizers has seen dramatic growth since uh, the year 2000. And it has a wide range of products, but these are not necessarily new products. It includes a compound or complex fertilizers, uh, secondary and micronutrients, uh, various technical grades and water soluble products, liquids, enhanced phosphate products such as uh, mosaics, uh, microessentials or OCPs, uh, fortified fertilizer line. It includes conventional fertilizers uh, that are combined together. Uh, Simpla has a product called Fusion, which is a mixture of ammonium nitrate and ammonium sulfate. And then there's powder coated micronutrients and these enhanced efficiency products. I think most of the major fertilizer companies either produce or sell some sort of a specialty fertilizer. Uh, Claudia mentioned enhanced efficiency fertilizer several times and, and they're defined by the American Association of Plant Food Control Officials as fertilizer products with characteristics that allow increased plant uptake and reduce the potential of nutrient loss to the environment when compared to an appropriate reference product. And so among those products, you would consider sulfur uh, coated urea. And there was a question about that uh, previously. Well, this was actually developed by TVA over 50 years ago. And when you coat uh, urea with sulfur, uh, it forms an impermeable layer that keeps the water out. And as that sulfur, it's an elemental sulfur, as it slowly decomposes from microbial and chemical and physical processes, um, it allows that hydrolysis of the urea to take place and release ammonium. It has been shown to reduce uh, or to increase plant nitrogen uptake and to reduce ammonia uh, volatilization. But there are problems with it, uh, with the coating, because it's very brittle. Uh, there's problems with how thick the coating is. And of course, the sulfur does generate acidity, adding to you know, the nitrogen. Probably the most common product out there is these organic polymer-based coated urea products. These are all based on proprietary technology. Um, one of the most common and first ones, I think, on the market was Nutrien's uh, ESN. Product and there are other companies uh, have these polymer coated uh, urea products. Compared to the sulfur coated urea, these synthetic polymers tend to be more effective because of the coating on them uh, is much more easier controlled and you get better diffusion uh, of the nitrogen out of those uh, as they <coughs> break down. You control the release by varying the polymer permeability, its composition, its thickness, and then it's also impacted 
by soil moisture and soil uh, temperature. And th these products have been proven uh, to work uh, under a variety of conditions. Another product out there is biopolymer-based uh, coated urea. These are coating ureas with plant or animal-based products. Uh, could be lignans or chitins. Uh, they control the release of these products by the thickness of the coating, and they can be combined with starches and can be biodegradable. One of the most common of these products is uh, neem. It's an oil that is produced from a seed from the neem tree, uh, from a plant. Uh, it's a very affordable product, especially for smallholder farmers, and it's mostly used in India where the technology was developed. In 2015, the Indian government mandated that the urea producing uh, manufacturers in India uh, coat their urea with neem to try and increase its efficiency. And it does work. Uh, it, we've seen nitrification inhibition ranging from a few percent to 30% when compared with non-treated urea. So if you look at the modes of actions of all of these enhanced efficiency products, we're looking at either urease uh, or nitrification inhibition. Uh, they're viewed as the best opportunities. Um, one of the most common uh, urease inhibitors out there is NBT. It's marketed as Agrotain by Coke. Um, there's others. Uh, there's uh, potential problems with this type of a product because of limited adherence uh, on the urea and it's not necessarily stable for long-term storage. And, and I'm not really going to go into much data, but there's a fair amount of data that you can find out there showing that these products do uh, reduce volatilization over, over time. Um, as far as nitrification inhibitors, uh, DCD is probably the most common. Um, in contrast to the urea, inhibitors, uh, nitrification inhib inhibitors, re retards the nitrification rate by uh, attacking the nitrifying bacteria. And because nitrification occurs for a long period of time, upwards of a month, whereas urea hydrologous is relatively short, just a week or so, um, these inhibitors have to work over an extended period of time to really be effective but they provide a great opportunity to synchronize nitrogen release with crop demand, and they can potentially reduce N2O emissions and uh, reduce nitrate leaching. Some of the challenges of these products, uh, despite their agronomic benefits, um, you know, enhanced efficiency fertilizers can lead to environmental disposition of potentially hazardous residues, which impact the biodegradability. These little polymer coatings can still resist list in the soil after the urea is long since gone. And so in response to some of these undesirable residual effects, the European Union has adopted a proposal that uh, in their fertilizer regulations to include a biodegradability requirement uh, for these products. Now looking at some of the new things that are coming, we have this whole idea of nanotechnology, and that's trying to manipulate and utilize materials at a nanoscale. Um, so those are, and a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And so when we're talking about nanoscale, it's considered to be less than 100 nanometers. These nanoparticles are very reactive because they're so small and because they have a large surface area. But there are concerns with them about unintended environmental impacts when they're exposed to biological systems. Some concerns about their phytotoxicity. Largely, these concerns are there because a lot of the initial research was done looking at them, uh, looking at their biotoxicity, and, and really not research directed to any beneficial effects that they might have in terms of fertilizer. But it's a, that is one of the things that are hanging out there. So the technology is similar to polymer coating uh, of urea. Uh, you can reduce the size of the coating material uh, anywhere from 10 to 1,000 times. And again, because of their size, they enhance surface area and reactivity compared to bulk particles. These products do provide the potential to engineer specific prop, uh, properties to control or slow the release of nitrogen from plant uptake. There's a variety of examples of nano fertilizer products, and you can kind of read this uh, on the screen. None of these products, I will tell you right now, are mainstream products. Um, they're mainly uh, at an experimental level 
Um, and there's a lot of things that need to be worked out in terms of their practicality, uh, how you use them, with how farmers can conventionally use them, and the economics associated with them. There are other products out there that uh, could fall into this category, things like a polyhalite, which is a new a potash fertilizer, which has been demonstrated to have some uh, ability to slow down uh, nitrogen reactions in the soil. And, and there's iron pyrites that uh, potentially have the same thing. So it's, it, there's more than just these nano fertilizers. So as a group, enhanced efficiency fertilizers, I think they do demonstrate the ability to modify release rates of nitrogen um, through inhibition, uh, the coatings, nanotechnology, or, uh, you know, fusing or, or mixing them together with other nutrients. Um, but their performance, as always, will vary depending on your ecological, uh, your agroecological location, because there's different soils, different textures, different slopes, drainage, organic matter, pH, and of course, uh, amount of rainfall and temperature all impact uh, how these products work. One of the interesting areas that are out there is this whole idea of biofertilizers and biostimulants. And uh, this is a, a new emerging area so there's a tremendous amount of interest in. And I borrowed this slide from Patrick Brown. Uh, Patrick Brown is a professor at UC Davis who has done a lot of work uh, on these particular products uh, of late. And it looks like this idea of biofertilizers and biostimulants, because there's a lot of overlap and similarities in how these products work, are really merging into one area. <coughs> Just to give you an idea of this, the market size here in North America, the, uh, the global biofertilizer market size was valued at somewhere between one to $2 billion in 2019, with an expected uh, compound annual growth rate between 10 and 12% over the next five years. It's expected to get up to about $4 billion uh, globally by 2025. Um, North America, of course, is much smaller than that. And there's much greater growth right now in Europe and in uh, Asia. The growth is largely being driven by organic agriculture, uh, environmental concerns uh, about the use of fertilizers, and of course, food safety issues. If you try and understand what the definition of these products are, uh, the European Union defined, uh, defined plant uh, biostimulants as fertilizing, uh, a fertilizing product, uh, the function of which is to stimulate plant nutrition processes independently of the product's nutrient content, with the sole aim of improving one or more of the following characteristics of the plant or the plant rhizosphere, such as nutrient efficiency, tolerance to abiotic stresses, quality, traits, or the availability of poorly soluble nutrients in the soil or rhizosphere. And so the Europeans have adopted some formal definitions. In the United States, uh, this whole issue has not yet been resolved. Uh, the 2018 Farm Bill uh, did make an attempt at trying to come up with a definition of these products. Um, but right now, there is no legal definition of what a biofertilizer uh, is. And so that's still uh, to be determined. Um, if you look at the uh, industry itself, there's great interest in biologicals. And over the next uh, several years, we're going to see more and more interest. There's been quite a few uh, mergers of or alliances between large crop production companies and small biological companies or startups in terms of R&D, uh, commercial agreements, and we are expecting that there will be more in the future. The challenge with biologicals is they follow a legacy of skepticism. Uh, there's been too many underdeveloped products were launched in the last 20 years, and the new product, uh, the new generation of products really need to do what they claim they can do, and they make some amazing claims. And so uh, it is an interesting area. They have some challenges and some limitations. One, you're dealing with a very complex interactions in the rhizosphere, and every plant depends on how it interacts with these biologicals in order to survive and thrive. Now, there's no broad spectrum of activity. So each of these products needs to have a very good ID profile of what they might do. They have to be efficiently formatted and formulated to be commercially viable. They have to be economic. 
and they need to be kept alive in the packages during the treatment process, whether it's on the seed itself or in the soil, and they have to be compatible with other biologicals that are out there. So you have this age-old question, are these products simply snake oils that can cure all, or do they offer real critical benefits to agriculture? And um, I, I think even though there's an attitude of the snake oil side of this business, I think is still prevailing out there, these products do offer some critical benefits to agriculture, um, and they will continue to. These aren't really new products. Um, you know, we used to talk about inoculants. Uh, as products containing living microorganisms, whether they're bacteria or fungi, um, and they're categorized either as nitrogen fixing or phosphate solubilizing or plant growth promoting. Just got a picture here on the screen of the very first uh, biofertilizer that was uh, developed and patented years ago in the United States. <coughs> In terms of biofertilizers, there's definitely been a lot more activity in Asia, uh, especially China and India, uh, than in North America, and more than in Europe, but Europe is very actively engaged in these products. Some of the challenges that the Asians have faced is loss of efficiency of these products due to high temperatures, a lack of cold supply chains, a dependency on external storage and climatic conditions, you know, the cost of refrigeration, poor performance of liquids, and you know, the cost of freeze drying products. And so shelf life uh, is a big concern. They've tried to address this by looking at micro encapsulation technologies. And this is just a slide that kind of gives you a, a picture of what a micro encapsulated bacteria might look like. This is research and activity that is being done out of a group in India, which again are, as I mentioned, very active. We have this whole area of phosphate solubilizing microorganisms, and uh, the use of these products has they've been around and studied for quite a few years. And they work by either lowering the soil pH by producing organic acids, or by chelating cations and competing with phosphate on adsorption sites, or they impact uh, improve the mineralization of organic phosphorus uh, through producing phosphatases. There's a whole host of these products, and this is just a slide that you can see from a recent review that's showing how diverse this group of phosphorus solubilizing microorganisms are. So they do include bacteria, fungi, <coughs> and, um, and we know that they work, but again, there are challenges. One of the first products that I was familiar with and had some experience with early in my career was Penicillium bellagii which was developed by Reg Cusey in 19, the early 80s. Uh, he was a scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and he isolated this fungi from Canadian prairie soils, and he demonstrated that it could solubilize phosphate, and it did increase the growth, uh, and up, growth and uptake of phosphorus in wheat and beans. Um, this uh, technology, I guess, was acquired by Philem Bias, a biotech company, uh, back in 1986, and they began to develop it under a variety of names. It first started out as PV50, and then it was called Provide, and I think now it's called Jumpstart. And Film Bias has since been acquired, acquired by Novozymes. And so the, the challenge of commercializing these products is, is uh, quite, a, quite significant. And there's an interesting story here, if you care to look it up, about how uh, film bias went about commercializing this product. Not a phosphorus necessarily solubilizing compound, but it fits in that category is a product called the Veil. This is a malic idaconic copolymer marketed to increase phosphorus use efficiency by increasing phosphorus solubility. So it works indirectly. And according to the label, it's designed to sequester antagonistic metals in the soil surrounding the fertilizer granules to reduce the type of phosphorus to make it more available to the plant. Um, studies do support this mode of action, but they, they don't agree. And this is a fairly controversial product. Um, recently, a couple of years ago, uh, a meta-analysis of all of the field work that had been done on that was completed. And it really showed that you could get about a 2% yield increase. But as you went through the meta-analysis, uh, the authors of that uh, found out that only uh, 
you know, 116 of the observations of all of these field trials were actually done on low soil test phosphorus conditions or other conditions where you might expect a phosphorus response. And so as they took some of this other data out, they could increase the, uh, you know, the results of positive yields upwards of 6%. <coughs> but what I wanted to point out here is the authors reminded us all of the importance of applying fundamental soil fertility principles when designing and evaluating fertilizer crop response trials. And in my mind, that has been one of the big challenges with a lot of these biofertilizer products is applying this principle to, as, to them as they're trying to do the research on them. So is this the future of, of uh, fertilizer? You know, are we looking for farmers to take field samples and go through a traditional soil test uh, type of analysis and then add to that some sort of a, a sequencing technology to look at the microbiology of the soil and then plug that into some sort of a, a recommendation tool, some sort of a computer model to come up with a recommendation of fertilizers and, and these, these new bioproducts. Um, you know, is that really going to be the future of the industry? Keep in mind that the global fertilizer industry right now is about $140, $140 billion industry, whereas over the next few years, these biofertilizers are forecast to get upwards of close to $4 billion. I don't believe that biofertilizers will replace synthetic fertilizers, but they certainly can supplement uh, some of the plant nutrient requirements. Um, this legacy of skepticism, uh, this idea of snake oil, certainly has not disappeared among these products. Um, in terms of nanofertilizers, a lot of the basic research for these uh, products is required, especially at a, micro, at a macronutrient level. Most of the activity has been done on micronutrients. But there's not been buy-in from the mainstream fertilizer industry yet. I think until the, the large manufacturers start to look at nanofertilizer technology as a, mean, as a means of supporting the macronutrient business, it's, it's just not going to take off very well. So the performance of these products varies by uh, agroecological location due to differences in slope, uh, texture, soil texture, drainage, organic matter, pH, and climate. And we have to remember uh, applying fundamental soil fertility principles when designing and evaluating these type of products in terms of their use as a fertilizer. I believe they have a role to play, but there are still probably a lot more questions than there are answers. And with that, I will uh, conclude. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. That certainly gives us a lot to think about. And uh, some, Partial answers and a whole lot more to come if we're going to solve the solve the food uh, problem for the future. I uh, really appreciate that. I'm now going to open up the uh, Q and A box, and we have time for only a couple of questions. There is one question in there that I'll just re reiterate because it's general. The, these events are being recorded, and the recordings will be available. And yes, the the presentation materials I believe are going to be available as well. So that should get one of the questions out of the way. Um, one of the first questions that came in, I think related to the earlier part of your, of your presentation was, uh, what are the uses of defomer in P205 manufacturing? Could you repeat that question? I didn't get it. Uh, sorry, it's what are the uses of defomers in the P205 manufacturing? Yeah, I mean, defomers are part of that engineering process that are used in a variety of fertilizer manufacturing activities. And I think it, it uh, how, how well they work or where they would be applied really would depend along the early stages of when you're taking the rock and you're crushing it and you're trying to prepare it to go through a processing plan. I'm not a chemical engineer and it's certainly not my area of expertise. Um, I know there's a role to play, but I'm not the right guy to answer that question. Okay, um, I'm going to take a question from Eva Made from CFIA. The terminology of specialty fertilizers used in the regulatory context is very different than what was provided in the presentation, which of course was the, the US uh, definition. How, if at all, can we reconcile these differences? Yeah, this whole question of terminology 
um, is an interesting one when you travel around the world. And especially fertilizers, um, there's always a definition of these products and then there's what the public thinks or what those in the industry, how they apply them. And, um, you know, enhanced efficiency fertilizers is officially defined, I think, here in North America. Uh, it is not necessarily defined in Europe or in Asia. And so uh, I think we need to be aware that there's more generic definitions versus official definitions that are put into regulations which apply to the fertilizers. And so I know that there's differences. Um, that is an area that does need work, especially globally. There isn't a consensus, uh, I think, from one country to another necessarily. And so a lot of the larger countries, European Union and, and the United States, do have an opportunity to provide some leadership uh, in those areas. But uh, that is an issue, correctly identified. Okay, I'm going to squeeze one more question in and the ones that we can't get to now, hopefully we have time at the very end of the session when all the presenters will be on a panel. There are a number of new products on the market with low rates of NBPT compared to market standards. How would farmers and or agronomists know what rate of NBPT will be effective? Yeah, I mean that, they don't know. And the only way that you're gonna find that out is to conduct some of your own on-farm research or get researchers to do it. And again, that question illustrates part of the challenge with a lot of these new biofertilizers. We don't know how effectively they work under the right conditions. We know that there's great potential, but as all agronomic practices, they have to be used within the right context, within the right farming system and the cropping system that that particular grower is using. Well, thank you, Dr. Roberts. You've certainly given us a lot to think about. Uh, it's a complicated world out there and it's not getting any easier. Uh, but we really appreciate that information and I give you our virtual event round of applause. Thank you very much for attending because I understand you're in a little bit of Indeed. environmental plight where you are in, in your part of the world right now with storms and whatnot. So we appreciate your, your ability to make it. Um, okay, at this time, folks, I'm going to move on to our third presenter, and that would be Greg Bartley, who is the Director of Crop Protection and Crop Quality at Pulse Canada. Uh, Greg is an, a, an, a, an MSc in Plant Science from the University of Manitoba and is a cer certified crop advisor. At Pulse Canada, Greg works to ensure the Canadian pulse industry benefits from access to affordable crop protection products through minor use registration and adoption of import tolerances and MRLs, the focus of this discussion today, in the global marketplace. He will be speaking on phosphonic acid detected. Are fertilizers contributing to MRL non-compliances? Greg, we're very happy to have you here. Take it away. Perfect. Thank you for that introduction. And, and thank you to everyone here uh, for joining this presentation. Um, really happy to be presenting this, this type of presentation to this audience. Um, I recognize that this is likely a bit of a, a different type of presentation that maybe you're used to when we start to talk about MRLs, especially related to fertilizer products. But um, bear with me. I'll definitely make the connection throughout the presentation of, of why I'm here today and, and hopefully uh, how you may be able to help me uh, after, after this presentation. So. Uh, to start things off, a bit of an introduction, I uh, just want to go over who we are at Pulse Canada. So Pulse Canada is a national commodity association representing both the growers and the exporters and traders of, of Pulse crops in Canada. So our members are the Ontario bean growers, Alberta Pulse growers, Manitoba Pulse and soybean growers, and Saskatchewan Pulse growers that represent the growers. And for the exporters and traders of Pulse crops, uh, they are represented through the Canadian Special Crops Association. Just to give you a brief uh, overview of the global pulse industry, um, when it comes to top pulse producers uh, in the world, uh, India is by far the, the greatest pulse producer uh, in the global, in, around the globe at about 20% of the pulse production, and Canada is a close second producing about 10% of the global pulse production. However, if we look at top pulse exporters, Canada is by far the greatest exporter of pulse crops to the global marketplace, supplying about a third of the pulse uh, crops to, into that global marketplace. 
Uh, just to give you a brief um, rundown of, of our where we export our pulse crops. Uh, so this is our top 10 export markets for Canadian pulses in, in 2019. And as you can see, about 60% of our, our total pulse production went into about three different markets, uh, China, Bangladesh, and India. Uh, but the real take home message here is that uh, we are very export dependent. We export about 85% of our pulses that are grown in Canada, and we export to over 120 different countries. So uh, a lot of countries to, to stay on top of as far as regulations and MRL requirements as I'll get into uh, in just a bit. So when we're exporting to over 120 different countries, uh, it's really important to recognize that uh, customers or end use countries uh, do have their own requirements. And what we're seeing right now is that these requirements are becoming a lot more complex. You know, Canada is very um, in a very good place as far as trade. We do have a lot of free trade agreements with other, other countries, and, and this is very beneficial. However, I'd say over the past number of years, we are seeing a rise in what we call non-tariff trade barriers. Uh, and there's certain aspects um, that, that implicate farmers uh, when we see an increase in non-tariff trade barriers. So all these countries have the ability to, to regulate uh, food to protect plant, animal, human, environmental health. Uh, they're, they're, they have that right and ability. However, we'd really like to see that uh, these regulations are based on sound science and are in line with WTO obligations uh, when they are making these regulations. So certain things that we are paying close attention to at, at Pulse Canada and other national commodity associations are things like pesticides and their residues or MRLs. Uh, seed technology, such as biotechnology, plant diseases like blackleg and fusarium, and uh, weed seeds is obviously becoming a much more uh, problem, a greater problem as well. So the main focus of this presentation is really on MRLs. And uh, before I get into our, our specific market access um, case that we're dealing with right now, I just want to give you a brief introduction or overview of, of what an MRL is, just to make sure we're on the same page. So. An MRL stands for maximum residue limit, and an MRL represents the maximum amount of pesticide residues that are expected to remain on a food product when the pesticide is used according to label directions. So I just want to highlight here, it, it's not a measure of food safety. That's not what MRLs are intended for. Uh, they're mainly used for trade purposes to, to give that indication that, that that pesticide product was used according to label directions. However, the, the key thing I want to mention here is that um, even though we establish our own MRLs here in Canada and we must meet those requirements, uh, when we export our products, uh, Canadian crops must meet the MRLs set by destination countries uh, in order to avoid, avoid trade disruptions. And what we see right now is, is MRLs are becoming a greater problem with more countries making their own MRL lists uh, or going away from or moving away from international standards such as Codex, uh, where we see a lot of misalignment and mis uh, at missing MRLs in export markets. So it's, it's a real challenge, uh, but I just want to highlight that um, it's something I really need to stay on top of. And it's really important that, that you recognize this challenge that we're dealing with. So just a caveat right from the start here, I'm not here today to advocate for MRLs on fertilizer products. Not my intention. It's something I don't want to see. Um, I think we have enough challenges with MRLs on pesticide products themselves. So just want to make that clear uh, in this presentation. So to talk about our, our specific market access uh, non-compliance that we're dealing with right now. So this is came up or we, we started to deal with this problem in, in early 2020 when an exporter notified Pulse Canada of exceeding the Fossil Aluminum MRL uh, for Pulse Crops into the EU. So the EU has a Fossil Aluminum MRL for Pulse Crops at uh, two parts per million, so extremely low amounts. This one took us by a bit of a surprise. Uh, typically when we, we get notified of MRL non-compliances, um, we can trace it back to a product that was used on a farm. Uh, but in this specific case, uh, we do not have fossil aluminum pesticide products registered for use on pulse crops in Canada. So the first logical, I guess, step to, to consider is that was this product used on, unauthorized? And we believe this is highly unlikely. Um, I'll touch a bit more on why I think about that in a bit. Um, so, I guess since early 20, Pulse Canada has continued to see uh, several cases, more cases of non-compliances throughout the year, and it's been a very, um, I guess, uh, inconsistent. You know, it's, it's different provinces that have been impacted, different exporters, and, and a few different pulse types. So, it, it's really taken us by surprise and, and a little concerning of, of where this trend is going. So. To, to help understand this, uh, we're really asking yourself, where is this coming from? Why are we seeing the fossil aluminum MRL when we, we're not using these products? And we'll start off by just getting, digging into a bit more of what fossil aluminum is. So fossil aluminum is a fungicide product 
that's registered for use on turf and horticulture crops in Canada. So these are things like vegetables, fruits, ornamentals, turf, tobacco, ginseng. Um, as you can see, this is a very different industry than our, our grains and old seeds uh, type production uh, in Canada. Uh, so it's, it's highly unlikely that farmers are, are using this product un unauthorized, uh, just due to the fact that they likely don't even have access to this product in their warehouses or, or on their farm. As I say, that the Horton turf industries are very different than grain and old seed production. Um, the next thing to highlight here is, is the residue definitions for phosphatol aluminum. Uh, so in Canada, when we test for, for residues and to see if we're compliant with MRLs, uh, Canada only tests for phosphatol itself. Uh, it's the parent company, that's all they're testing for to determine if it's compliant or not. However, the European Union, uh, their residue defini definition is a bit more expanded than just phosphatol. Uh, their residue definition is the sum of phosphatol plus phosphonic, ac phosphonic acid and salt. Uh, the reason why they've included phosphonic acids in the residue definition is that phosphonic acid is a degradation product of phosphatol aluminum. So as you can see, phosphatol aluminum breaks down into phosphatol and phosphatol breaks down into phosphonic acid. And, and what we've been told is that this degradation of phosphatol to phosphonic acid happens very fast. So this is the main justification of, of why it's included in that residue definition, uh, just because typically if you can't test for that parent company, uh, if it breaks down really fast, uh, they usually like to include phosphonic acids or that degradation product uh, to, to determine compliance. I just want to say right now, this is a very poor residue definition. Um, I imagine a, a few of you on, on, uh, in the audience uh, recognize that phosphonic acids uh, are very well persistent in the environment. Uh, there's many potential sources of phosphonic acids uh, than just phosphatol aluminum. So, what I want to highlight here is that the detection of phosphonic acid does not actually give us a good indication that phosphatol aluminum was used. And in my view, uh, it should not be included in the overall definition, but here we are. So uh, just to highlight here, uh, I'm switching now to, instead of focusing on phosphatol aluminum, this is where I'm going to switch to our attention to phosphonic acids. Uh, now that we recognize that this is actually the issue of phosphonic acids rather than phosphatol aluminum itself. So what is, what is phosphonic acid? Uh, this is something I ask myself every day as we continue to deal with it. And uh, I'm sure as you go through this presentation, you recognize that I'm, I'm still trying to help answer this question. So to my understanding, uh, phosphonic acids uh, are a broad category of organic phosphorus compounds, also known as the phosphonates. Um, they're both natural and manufactured sources. Uh, and these uses include uh, both agriculture and medicine. Um, in nature, uh, we can find phosphonic acids that uh, are both commonly found in the soil and aquatic environments. Uh, to my knowledge, they're, they're quite water soluble and, and quite persistent in the environment too. So they don't break down very easily. So they can be found in, in water sources or soils for, for several years is my understanding. As far as manufactured sources, uh, there's many potential for, for phosphonic acids. So things like fertilizers, pesticide products, uh, water conditioners, plant health products, uh, just to name a few uh, examples of where you might be able to find uh, some of these products. I just want to take a time out here and, and recognize that uh, we're not the first ones that have dealt with this one. Um, I just want to highlight uh, two other industries that have been impacted by this issue and where we can focus on to, to help search for, for answers of, of what, uh, for the reason behind this issue. So the first one I want to highlight is that the EU organic industry has been heavily impacted uh, by this phosphonic acid uh, MRL requirement. Um, however, they're kind of in a similar position where they're scratching their head and asking where is this coming from. So within the organic industry, uh, phosphate aluminum or phosphate fertilizer, pro fertilizer products are not approved uses in the organic industry. You know, these are synthetic products and, and do not meet those organic requirements. Uh, so it's still unclear to them where these residues are coming from. Uh, they've done a lot of work to try and determine this. Uh, potentials are uh, other fertilizer sources that they do have access to. Uh, there's potential that maybe phosphonic acids are included in those without uh, them knowing or it's been persistent in the soil and, and it's still taking some time to, to make its way out. The U.S. tree nut industry is another one that's been heavily impacted by this, but uh, they've had a little more success in, in finding a solution and actually resolving this issue for themselves. So what the U.S. tree nut industry found is that uh, phosphate products were actually commonly used uh, by some of their growers. Uh, so this is, they highlighted that potassium phosphate and similar products were, were being used and do contribute to phosphonic acids. Uh, and they mentioned that uh, it, it's a lot of micronutrient products or fungicide products uh, have the potential as well. So phosphates are attached to, to certain micronutrient products or they're using uh, the, the phosphate products as a fungicide, it's fungicide as phosphates do have fungicidal activity uh, for some phytophthora control. 
I just want to highlight here that the U.S. tree nut industry did have some success in resolving that issue. So when they first brought this attention to the EU, when they made some of these MRL changes uh, within the EU, uh, they were able to success successfully get a, a temporary tolerance of 75 parts per million. So this is much higher, obviously, than the two parts per million that we're dealing with, uh, just to continue to facilitate, facilitate trade as they navigated and determined a, a solution for their issue. Um, what they actually had to do was uh, establish an MRL for, for their products uh, using these potassium phosphate products. So generate residue data very similar to a, a crop protection product and, and apply for an MRL or an import tolerance based on that data. So that takes uh, several years to, to do and summarize. And at the end of the day, they're actually able to establish a tolerance of 500 parts per million. So in terms of MRLs, this is extremely high value and just gives the indication of, of you know, how persistent uh, phosphonic acids can appear on certain crops, but also gives the indication that uh, this really isn't a food safety type issue. Uh, we're not really concerned that that is causing a food safety issue uh, because these tolerances are so high and shown to be safe. So getting back to our, our specific case, and I, I just want to walk you through to be, uh, walk you through a bit of our view of, of where our minds have gone in determining certain sources of these products and then touch on, on how maybe you could help to, to uh, get us to a point where we can maybe resolve this issue. So our first logical question is, is there other registered pesticide sources that are, are being used by our farmers that have the potential to contribute to phosphonic acids? So we've reached out to the PMRA uh, to, to help answer this question. And they've identified a few products that, that have the potential to contribute to phosphonic acids. Uh, so these are things like mono and dipotassium salts and phosphorus acid mono and dibasic sodium, potassium and ammonium phosphites. Uh, these products do have that potential to contribute to phosphonic acids. However, none of these products are also registered for use on pulse or grain crops and unlikely to come from rotational crops. So recognizing that if it's applied to a, a crop that it is registered in, it's very unlikely that a pulse crop would follow that and uh, get phosphonic acids uh, into that grain. So we're fairly confident that phosphonic acid residues are, are not coming from a crop protection source, uh, but obviously some still more work to be done to, to make sure we rule, out, rule this out officially. So our attention uh, goes to fertilizer sources next. next. Um, obviously, we, we've done a lot of digging into the issue and, and knowing that the EU organic industry has experienced this, the, the US tree uh, net industry has experienced this, and, and a lot of the fact sheets and, and resources indicate that fertilizer is the most likely source of phosphonic acids. Um, however, a lot of these resources have very little attention on, on soil applied fertilizer, so our spring applied fertilizers. So when we talk to a lot of our growers to help understand the, the agronomic practices that they're doing on their farm to get an indication of maybe a, a product that might be contributing to it, um, in many cases their, their only fertilizer use is a spring applied fertilizer, very typical uh, and nothing surprising. So that, that's going to be one of my questions is, is what is the potential for some of these spring applied fertilizers to contribute to phosphonic acids? Uh, that is something I, I would really like to know. Um, if you dig into a lot of these fact sheets and, and resources, uh, they often identify foliar fertilizer products um, as, a, as a more potential or a greater potential as a source of phosphonic acid residues. So understanding this, uh, we were actually able to, to find a product that one of our growers was using. So just in one case where a, a foliar fertilizer product was used, and after confirming that residues were detected on that product and reaching out to that product manufacturer, they, they, did, get, they did give us indication that phosphates were actually included in that formulation. So after reaching out, explaining that this is actually contributing to an MRL uh, issue, they were indicated that they were able to reformulate that product and it should no longer be an issue. So we view that as a good thing. You know, we found a product, but um, the more we started asking questions and and realized is that product actually shouldn't have been on the market to begin with. So I just want to highlight the, the CFIA position on phosphate and phosphorus acid uh, products and, and the current regulations uh, for these types of products uh, through a position by the CFIA. So the CFIA actually indicates that uh, for phosphate materials, uh, when they're sold as a, as a fertilizer only source or a nutrient source, uh, they actually do not meet the definition of a plant nutrient and thus a fertilizer. Uh, this is due to phosphates actually having a, a phosphorus thing uh, limiting uh, ability in the plant. So under low phosphorus uh, conditions, they could actually starve the plant of phosphorus and, and do not provide any benefit. Um, 
So the only way for a phosphate type product to, to possibly be registered here, here in Canada and used is if it's uh, sold in combination uh, with a plant available nutrient and registered as a, as a fertilizer pesticide and has to be registered through the, the PMRA under the uh, Pest Control Product Act. And that would have MRL and, and residue data to go along with it. So um, just want to highlight that here today is that there is a CFI position on phosphate and phosphorus acid uh, products. And it's, it's really important to, to recognize uh, this. So Pulse Canada is, is continuing to do a lot of work to try and determine where the sources of these residues come from. So I, I indicated, but I just want to formally mention that uh, we have surveyed uh, a few growers to identify uh, any products that may be contributing to phosphonic acid residues. Uh, so this is looking at their full agronomic practices or trying to get an indication of, of everything that they're doing for, for that current crop year, but also looking uh, to that previous crop as well. And we're asking for information on fertilizer use, crop protection products, uh, any plant health products that are being used, um, how they're storing their crop, uh, things like this. And something to highlight here too is that uh, this previous year, actually uh, a common denominator in, in all the cases that we, we found was that uh, stress growing conditions were, were often highlighted. So the, the crop went through a drought phase at some point. Um, now, obviously correlation doesn't, does not equal causation. So I'm not saying that these stress conditions is, is the cause of why we're uh, seeing phosphonic acid residues. But uh, I think it's something to, to not ignore and as we try and navigate the, the full source of these residues. Uh, we also have a project that's currently underway to determine the, the prevalence of phosphonic acid residues on our pulse crop. So, you know, we don't have any MRL requirements for, for phosphonic acids here in Canada. So we actually have no indication of, you know, how widespread this, this could potentially be. So with that, uh, it, it's a little concerning not doing that type of information, but uh, we're doing what we can to to get sources of, of farm samples to do some testing just to see was this a couple one-off cases or is this a much, a, a much bigger problem or a potential problem than, than maybe we're aware of. So to kind of wrap things up a bit, uh, I just want to pose a few questions uh, as far as how, how you can help, how this audience can help in the fertilizer industry to, to help navigate this, this issue that we're currently dealing with and, and hopefully provide uh, some assistance to, to uh, look for a solution. So, the first thing I just want you to be aware of is that the EU has emerald requirements for phosphonic acid. Uh, so this would be any crop being exported into EU. Um, so even though we don't have phosphonic acid uh, residue requirements here in Canada or the US, uh, the EU does. And as I mentioned earlier, when we talk about MRLs, it's not the MRLs of our, our domestic country, it's the MRLs of the importing country that we really have to pay attention to and have to meet when we export our products. So really important to recognize this. Um, just want to highlight again to, to follow that CFA guidance for phosphate products. So um, uh, make sure it is being registered uh, under the PCPA if that's where it uh, needs to be registered. Um, if you're aware of a product that does contain uh, contribute to phosphonic acids, uh, please contact me. Uh, I would really love to know about it. And, and this isn't to, to crack down or anything. Uh, we really need to do get a, a good handle on what types of products uh, may be contributing to this. So we can help resolve this issue. You know, it, it's really, as I mentioned, we are an export dependent um, uh, commodity, like all grain and oilseed crops here in Canada. And it's, it's really important to protect uh, this market access. If you have the capacity to test for your product for phosphonic acids, uh, please do so. You know, if you're questioning yourself and wondering, hmm, I, I'm not sure if our product might contain it or not. Um, if you have that capacity to test it, uh, that would be extremely helpful. And finally, if you have the technical expertise <laughs> that may help in greater understanding this issue uh, related to phosphonic acids, uh, how it might persist in the soil or, or water or potential sources, um, I, I would love to connect with you. And, and that would be greatly appreciated because uh, uh, this is out of my wheelhouse and I would really appreciate that assistance. So with that, uh, here's my contact information. Uh, please give me a call, uh, send me an email, whatever you like to do, if you do have some information that would, would help us in this case. And uh, I really appreciate the, the time today and the opportunity to, to bring this forward. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, that's quite a problem and that's uh, perplexing <laughs> for uh, downstream, uh, downstream uh, partners in the supply chain and, and uh, interesting because I represent the, I guess the, the product manufacturer and selling through to the retail end. And so um, I'm going to take that question back and see if I can uh, uh, get a discussion going inside within Nutrien. Thank you very much for that presentation. We're now going to open up the uh, session to Q&A. We've got some uh, time to answer, ask a number of questions and get some answers. And I'm going to start with Jeff Crampton. And 
his question is, how does phosphonic acid differ from phosphoric acid? You know, that's a question I keep asking myself too. Um, it's, it's quite a technical problem and I, I believe there are differences. Uh, so phosphorous acid, to my knowledge, uh, does not contribute to this problem. But again, really reaching out to the technical expertise in this audience to, to help answer some of these questions as, as that is something I would love to better understand too. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Gasham. Is there the same consideration and regulations for registering fertilizers as those for pesticides in Canada? Like for example, is a six pack toxicity report required? Again, I'd like to pose this question to the technical expertise, but to, to my understanding, uh, CFA does uh, ensure that the products are, are safe for use, uh, both for the environment and health, uh, to my knowledge. But um, as far as the details of that, again, I would likely defer to, to someone with more expertise in that. I can, I can answer at least part of that question. Uh, CFIA for fertilizers does have a hierarchy of safety in, in three levels, at, at least, in terms of they look at the chemistry of the product and they do ask for a goodly amount of information. And so it's fairly rigorous in terms of finding out how it's made, what it's made from and what it's supposed to do. And then depending on that information, they, they categorize it into one of those three levels from um, no real safety concerns to, okay, there needs to be more work. So for a lot of the products, there is not going to be a six pack toxicity report required, I believe. I can, I'm speaking for you Eva right now, but I'm pretty sure I understand the rules. So maybe there are some cases where that would be required, but not sort of across the board for more of the pesticide world. Okay, uh, enough for me. It's all about you, Greg. Uh, <laughs> moving on, Tom Brusela. Glyphosate contains a phosphonate form of P, possibly other pesticides do also. Has this been investigated as a potential source? Yeah, so, so one of the breakdown products of glyphosate is, is known as AMPA, and AMPA is a phosphonic acid. So this is something we have explored, uh, and we have determined that that, that is not the case uh, of where these phosphonic acids are coming from or what is being detected when the lab tests for phosphonic acids. Uh, so to, to our knowledge, uh, this isn't a case of, of glyphosate being used and uh, that degradation product AMPA being detected. Uh, this is separate from that. All right, thank you. Um, next question from George. What are the concentrations of phosphonate in European crops? Yeah, so when the EU changed this MRL residue definition, I believe it was in 2014, uh, this actually took a, a quite a few people uh, off guard. So typically when an MRL is changed, um, they have to put a WT notification out uh, of this MRL change. But since this is more of a, a technical change where they're, they're reclassifying some of these phosphonic acids, which have been associated with fertilizer use to that crop protection product side, uh, they viewed it as a technical and didn't have to provide notification. So with that, uh, a lot of co uh, companies came forward and said, hey, we're, we're now being detected by this MRL essentially overnight. And the, the EU is able to look back and see what type of uh, historical residue levels were found on a bunch of their products. So um, that could range to give an indication, I guess, when the U.S. tree nut industry found their, uh, got their temporary tolerance of 75 parts per million, that is a potential range of where that's obviously that, that temporary tolerance would have encompassed uh, previous uh, residue levels that have been found. So upwards of 75 parts per million were found depending on the product and, and the historical use uh, of these types of products. All right, thank you. And I've got a note in the chat here from Eva Maddy from CFIA, encouraging anybody who has any unresolved questions from a regulatory matter to contact her and, and specifically CFIA to get some further follow-up answers. So thank you, Eva. Next question. Oh, it's actually an answer from Tom Brusola. Phosphoric acid is H3PO4. Phosphorus acid is H3PO3. And phosphoric acid does not convert to phosphorus acid in soil. So there at least is the chemical difference. Perfect. But it I means appreciate that clarification. We still need to figure it, I guess. Yes. All right, uh, next question is from Clyde Graham, Fertilizer Canada. Is Pulse Canada worried about other residues from fertilizer and related products? At this point, no. Uh, this is the only one I'm aware of that uh, has potential MRL, uh, possible MRL implications, and hopefully this is the only one. Uh, so 
as long as phosphonic acids are included in this MRL definition, this would be our only concern. But uh, if there are any other residues, that, that obviously if there are other residues and they're, they're not included in MRL definition uh, and obviously not being tested for, then, then we don't have concern. So uh, short answer is, is no, we're, we're not aware of any other products that, that we'll uh, be concerned about. Thank you, Greg. Well, that appears to be all the questions right now. So you, I want to give you the virtual uh, round of applause for that great presentation. Certainly appreciate it and making the, this uh, event uh, uh, pretty, pretty impressive. So we're going to bring the other presenters back. And this is a sort of a bit of a panel situation. We've got uh, probably, oh, we've got a fair amount of time that we can devote to questions. This is a two hour event and if uh, my, my time tracking serves me right, uh, we, we can go as late as 12. There are a few questions that we didn't get to, so I'm going to try to go back to those, just taking them in order and trying to figure out the time frame. Okay, there's a number of questions related to your presentation, Dr. Roberts, just going on the time kind of frame guesstimate. Um, let me just find those questions. Okay, we asked, um, okay, a question from, this is one for you, uh, Dr. Roberts, from an anonymous attendee. At one to two billion US dollar market for biofertilizers globally, do you have any idea of what the North American market would be? Yeah, it, it's hard to put your finger on the fertilizer markets of these things. Uh, if you search online, there's a variety of market and analyst type firms that provide different estimates. And I've seen estimates, for example, in 2019, 2020, I've seen estimates of the U.S. biofertilizer market ranging from 470 million to 2, 2 billion. And... Um, you know, so they're all over the place. And so I, I tend to believe it's more closer to the $500 million uh, right now and it has the potential to double over the next five or six years. Uh, everybody that looks at these things tries to make a direct correlation to organic agriculture and the acres of organic agriculture. That's where they feel that these products will have the biggest uh, potential impact. And so I don't think anybody really knows what it is, but it is growing as the organic market continues to grow. Thank you. Next question is from, again, for you, Dr. Roberts, uh, from Clyde Graham. Is there a need for better guidelines, standards, et cetera, for product efficacy field trials? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know that we need better guidelines because I think the researchers certainly know how to test uh, these types of products and conduct good valid field research. Um, and the academic community and you know, others know how to do that. I think part of the challenge is a lot of these companies that are developing these products don't have that expertise. Um, these, a lot of times, some of these startups and these new biological companies that I'm aware of they might have good microbiology expertise, but they don't understand the fertilizer. They have had no experience doing basic fertility trials. And I think that's where the problem lies, is they're not working collaboratively with those that know how to do that type of research and activity uh, in an agriculture setting. Uh, you know, and they're marketing these products, they want to market them as fertilizers. So they, I think they have to work in that world. And, and I don't think that there's a lot of that yet. And so as we see some of the bigger fertilizer manufacturers getting involved, I think we'll see some improvements in that area. But I don't think that there's a need for more regulations about how you do these types of basic fertility trials and efficacy trials on these, these products. They're complicated because they're bio microbiology and uh, that's impacted by a lot of things. It's not the same as you know, doing a trial with a phosphate or a nitrogen fertilizer, there's much more control, I think, and predictability there. Sort of a more of a moving target. Yeah. All right, I see, thank you. Uh, now we're going to switch back to Greg. I see we have a question from our friend Daniel, uh, and this is a long one, so I'll try to speak clearly. 
Not sure if I got all the issue, but the analysis in the EU is part of their problem because of the H3PO3 being included. This should never be included in their assessment unless they are also using the actual mineralized aluminum within the crop. The nut industry, including their risk assessment to increase the MRL was most appropriate and the same should be done for the pulse crops. Just my comment. So not sure there's a question in there, but I, I guess yeah. he's asking, do I understand this properly? Yeah, no, that, that's a great take on the, on the problem and uh, summarize it really well. You know, this really is due to uh, the poor MRL definition and the inclusion of phosphonic acids when, in our opinion, in my opinion, and in Canada's opinion as well, is that uh, phosphonic acid should never be included in that residue definition. Um, you mentioned the nut industry and including it in their risk assessment and essentially generating residue data to, to apply for an import tolerance like a crop protection product. And ideally, you know, the pulse industry would like to do this. The challenge that we, we currently have right now is we, we haven't identified that, that product or source of those residues. So we, we can't go through that process until we actually know what may be contributing to it. Uh, so it makes it a little challenging, I guess, right now to, to navigate that. So. This is why I'm here today and, and maybe exposing this, this issue a little more than typically I'd like to, to do, especially when it's still an ongoing issue, uh, is to, to help identify where those potential sources can come from so we can help nail down uh, what really is going on uh, with this issue. All right, thank you. So now I guess since we have everybody back, uh, there's a general question from Clyde Graham. What advice would the presenters give to farmers trying to navigate these new product offerings that we've been speaking about. Anyone want to tackle that one? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start. I, I think farmers need to be cautious uh, with a lot of these new products. Um, they need to pay attention to the claims that are made um, and see if that seems reasonable to them. Um, farmers know how urea works or anhydrous ammonia. They know how, you know, MAP or DAP work, and they know the type of yield responses they get. When they're adding, uh, using some of these new products at a much smaller application rate, it's hard to measure what impact you're, you're going to have. And so I think the farmers need to be prepared to do some of their own on-farm research or to work with their advisor, their CCA, or someone that can help them really measure if these products are doing what they claim. Uh, it's been my experience with a lot of these products that they're sold by a lot of testimonials um, without a lot of hard data uh, to back it up. And that just takes a lot of research. I, I mentioned the challenge with the veil. There's been you know over 500 trials put out with that avail product that it's still a controversial product um, and yet it's increasing yields anywhere from two to you know almost six percent uh, under some circumstances and so farmers just have to go into these new products i think with their eyes wide open and be a little skeptical and compare compare it to their own experience with fertilizers they know how fertilizers work you know basic conventional fertilizers or how manure works uh, but I, they're worth looking at. You know, we can't discard them. I just think you have to be careful because they're expensive products and uh, you want to make sure you're achieving what the, they tell you they're going to achieve when you use them. And I, I think that leads in very well to what you were speaking about, uh, Dr. Wagner, in terms of we need to be doing something because the nitrogen equation is not going in the right direction. Any, anything further to add? Um, yeah, well, I, I think it, it's the challenge and I was really interested in Dr. Roberts' presentation to hear what is out there because I'm not um, familiar with all the newest uh, developments. And it seems like there are a lot of ideas out there, but we don't know yet if they work, right? So there is a need for um, a really concerted effort uh, to to try to find some of those products that have uh, a potential to work and, and help us address the issues we're, we're facing. So. Thank you. And, and Greg, I would sum up your presentation. Basically, uh, you know, what I took 
uh, from it as a main point is, is at your part in the supply chain that you represent, you see some issues and, and the, the level of technical knowledge and support that may be there, it's a, it's a matter of trying to access that a little bit better to solve problems. And so really what strikes me in all these presentations in terms of coming together, you know, we have some problems. We have some climate change problems and we have specific um, residue type problems and we have new product verification type problems. And so really, really what comes to mind for me is the level of collaboration, you know, with experts in one area working maybe in another or with people in another area is really maybe another element of the solution here because I've heard um, strong indications of a lot of knowledge um, in, in very pl various places and how do we leverage that knowledge better to solve these on a bigger scale seems to be seems to be the big takeaway for me at least. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. And, and also just highlight too that we're, we're likely in a, a spot where we are seeing agriculture production systems uh, potentially changing. You know, I think there's a lot of requests and we're seeing that uh, end use requirements are potentially driving what we want to do more than maybe we would like. And it, it's really important to, to recognize where some of these trends are going uh, to try to stay ahead of the curve, but also reinforce current practice that we're currently doing, uh, you know, the good things that we are doing uh, to make sure that, that uh, it is recognized as well. So. Thank you. So before I let everyone go, um, in case there's one more question that uh, needs to speak, uh, squeak in, I, we've got time. I'm just gonna cover a few reminders. Uh, the information uh, in these presentations will be made available. The, the uh, presentation, so the, the live event has been recorded and I believe that recordings are gonna be made available to everyone as well. I think this was an excellent event. You know, we've sort of adapted to COVID and I think uh, a lot more people are getting a lot more out of it than a face-to-face -face meeting. And so this is in my mind, excellent. Also remind people that if you would like to collect continuing education units or CEU credits for this session, apparently there is a QR code available or you can email Allison Watcher and she will help you out with that. As well, I'd also like to thank Kevin Jack, who's behind the scenes there from WeStream, making sure that all us presenters and moderators are pushing the right buttons and doing the right things, and so that this runs seamlessly. And I'm happy to say, I think it was highly successful. So round of virtual applause for you too, Kevin. And the other unsung hero in all of this is Allison Watcher, um, quietly behind the scenes, making sure we're where we need to be, doing what we need to be doing, and working out all the logistics. So Allison, you most certainly get a virtual round of applause as well. I, I really appreciate the presenter's time and everyone else that made this happen. And I do have one more question. So uh, I guess my talking is, is useful. Uh, about when, okay, let me just find these questions. Um, okay, so <laughs> a direct plea. Dr. Roberts, may I have your presentation? <laughs> so that's from Gasham, and I think the answer is yes, the presentations are going to be available. Can you show the QR code one more second? So um, I think, is that something you can do, Allison, or maybe uh, Kevin? Because I don't believe I have the QR code. Yep, I'll throw that up in a second. Okay, fair enough. And let me just switch, because I see there's a couple of things in the chat. Um, Great presentations, thanks for the excellent session. So we're getting, now it's switched from questions to getting some very uh, positive uh, feedback from, from the attendees. And we still have quite a few people hanging. So once again, folks, I'd really like to thank you for this event. I think you've made it a fantastic learning exp experience. Oh, do I have one more? Yes, okay. More congratulations, fantastic presentation. So I think we pulled it off folks. And I wanna thank you as the moderator. It truly has been a privilege to be a part of this. And um, thank you and remind you that we have additional sessions coming up. I believe the next one is next week on the, um, yes, okay, so we can bring that up. Yes, there it is. So we have the microbiomes November 5th another two hour session. 
We have CFIA, I guess we'll have to call it a virtual day on November 17th from 11 to 2.30 Eastern time. And then we have the uh, FSAC organizations uh, session on November 19th, and you can register for those items. All right, I think we're ready for the QR code. I wanna thank everybody. It's been, it's been a great experience for me as well. Thank you all. Great, thank you. Thank you.